okay, this bike shed is out of my session, so. <laughs> All right, hi everyone, and I'm here to talk to you about this awesome subject. I thought the room would be full, there would be a line to hear about the civil society engagement. Uh huh. Okay, and. Uh, Okay, this is me, our friends call me Thomas, please do that. And I want to open this with uh, Steve Crocker's quote, and because Casper told me I'm not to read my own slides, would anyone like to read this awesome quote for me? Thank you, sir. Yes, this is exactly how I feel about my life. <laughs> and perhaps uh, this is why I see a lot of sense in contributing to the civil society engagement, because internet engaging uh, with how this thing will actually go in a small and constructive way is, oh God, is one uh, of the things that developed very quickly and interests me. So, well, all right, resilient internet. And this is a very nice picture which I like. In a way, it will form uh, around and it will say one world, one internet. But does anyone in the audience recognize where it's from? Oh, well, that's a tricky one. Okay, so. This is actually TIA and um, the Telecommunication Authority of the Arab Emirates. And again, an awesome quote. Anyone? Oh, come on. Go on. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, so how I see human rights, it's not a pizza buffet, you can't pick the ones you like. Uh, but maybe this is actually a valid statement for that country. Um, I think for engagement, it's very important not to see things as black and white. Uh, should we, as an organization, go there? Should we work with them? A position is not very good, in my opinion. All right, so big words, I tried to avoid them. What is resilient internet? If we get this, I would be quite happy with internet being resilient. And let me move forward. So uh, internet society report, what drives change and impacted areas? Uh, as you can see, interesting for me there is digital divides. So. In some years, uh, the divide between people who live on their own internet island, who have no access to information, how to defend their privacy, can't participate in the economic society in the same way, it can grow or things can be different depending on how this will go. And I think the big words were there. Oh, there's a cyber. Oh my God, let's move forward. All right. A lot of words in the slide. Casper told me not to do this, so <laughs> moving on. But yeah, these are the forces that are working towards the resilient internet. So, do I want to be a hero for resilient internet? God, no. Because I know that if you get involved, it will end you with enormous amount of responsibility and it will be time consuming and diff difficult as hell. So the best idea ever is to contribute a little bit to the course which interests you. And I'll give several tips which worked for me and maybe will be interesting for you. So uh, first one, uh, if you do a heroic standoff, if the position is working consistently. It will trump you every single time. So consistent involvement is the only way to go. Beep! Beep? No beep? Uh, okay, well, there's four slides more. And okay, next one. Um, if you decide to get involved in a large organization or in a small one, like for instance, 
I can or something else. Respect your community, read the slides of the working group. Uh, do not waste their time by asking irrelevant questions. So that is how a small contribution can actually work. Okay, yay, ask relevant questions. And mentorship, we always say, okay, uh, sharing knowledge is important, but why people get tired of mentoring is because there is no consistency. Okay, follow up on the results of your work. And final note, do not complain and change stuff. Beep. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Yeah, Thomas. Just unmute when you want to start talking. Sorry? Unmute when you start talking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Okay, the floor is yours, uh, Andreas. Right, thank you. Um, I'm Andreas, I'm from Gothenburg. I'm going to talk about how many kinds of people there are. Um, whoa, this is, look, okay, we'll have to do it like this. Um, this doesn't look very nice. Okay, we'll have to do it like this, I guess. Technology can sometimes goes wrong. Um, you've all seen the t-shirts. There are one zero kinds of people. It's kind of stupid. You're supposed to uh, interpret it like this. It's a, bi it's a uh, binary representation. It maps out to there are two kinds of people. Um, and once you reach that state, stage, there are countless varieties, like there are two kinds of people, those who like uh, hot sauce and those who still have these taste buds. They're all not very funny and they're all unnecessarily divisive, but most of all, they are wrong. So how many kinds of people are there? Well, we can look at uh, how many uh, user groups you need in your uh, Linux system to accommodate all the cases. So uh, if there's only one user, you only need one group. Uh, if there are two users, you need three groups. Um, you need one for me, one for my friend, and one which we share together. For instance, root, since we trust each other and we share this server. If we have a third user, we all of a sudden need... Um, Oh, I didn't write how many there are. I think there are five, right? Or six or something. I don't remember. Um, but then we have uh, our new friend Leo, who is not in the roots group because he's not interested and he thinks that he would screw things up if he were. And, uh, but uh, both me and him like birds, so we're in the birds group. He and Julipan likes cats, so they're in the cats group. I like cats as well, but not as much as they do. And we all like books, so we should all be in the books group. In the general case, uh, for n users, you need a sum from k goes to one, from one to n, where n is the number of users, of n over k, which goes to the mesn number uh, n, or two to the power of n minus one. Uh, you might say, aha, but then I might have another group. There might be uh, other interests that are, uh, are common, like printers. Well, uh, we all would like to have access to the printers. Um, yes, but the set of the users in the books group and the set of the users in the printers books are exactly the same. So they are essentially the same book, uh, the same uh, group. They are not necessarily, one of them is redundant. Uh, it's a convenient thing to have when you administer, but it's not strictly necessary. It's not a new group, it's just a a copy or a soft link, if you like. So this is the true answer, 2 to the power of n minus 1. So some metaphysics of, uh, that we can base on this. This is speculative. There are more than two kinds of people. There are way more than two kinds of people. There are 2 to the power of n minus 1 kinds of people. Now, to get a bit dour, Every birth doubles the potential diversity of human society. Because, well, that's what 2 to the power of n does, right? On a more dire note, every death cuts it in half. <laughs> and that's not very funny, actually. Um, this, uh, if this doesn't convince you, 
of the unspeakable wrongness of cutting a life short when it's in full sight, then I suggest you go and read George Orwell's A Hanging. It's a magnificent essay on the dignity of human life, even though it does get the numbers wrong. So, that was basically it, but I still have some time, so I thought I'd show you this bonus slide. If you dismantle a Dalek, you can use it to listen to bats, build a theremin, or learn about fusion plasma turbulence. <laughs> Finally, some license information. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. One will go this way. So if I put it on, and this one should go like that. Yes. And this and when you want to start speak, you unmute it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you don't have any slides. No. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody. How? How? Uh, my name is Dimitris. Uh, how many live in Oslo? In the Oslo region. And how many live in the Gothenburg region? We have quite a few people who came in from Gothenburg as well. Um, have you heard ever there's um, a Silicon Valley startup accelerator called uh, Founder Institute? They are opening up in Oslo and in Gothenburg. And it's um, Silicon Valley started about five years ago with the idea to bring the uh, accelerator into different parts of the world. They're now in about 60 countries. The URL is fi.co, fi.co. And so if you put your settings for where you uh, see, whether it's uh, Oslo or Gothenburg, you could see that there are events in Gothenburg under, underway. And we'll be starting the first event in Oslo on the 9th of January. And these events are free of charge, and you could get uh, startup information that's useful, and we'll be having them regularly throughout the winter. And uh, if we get 35 students or more uh, who enroll, then we'll actually have a semester after Easter, or we might postpone it a bit. We're calling it in Oslo the exploratory phase, and Gothenburg's a couple months ahead of us already, so they're already having their, their events. And we're partnering with the local e ecosystem, and so we're looking for people who are interested in, who have startup experience, who might be interested in mentoring with us, who might have, uh, want to partner as venues as well, and so, and also, uh, perhaps people that you know in your network might be looking for the accelerator uh, that might be right for them. There are lots of accelerators in Oslo, depending on what kind of startup it is. This startup in particular will take people from just the idea phase, and the Founder Institute will go from just the idea phase all the way to accepting people who have a full team and a minimum viable product. And uh, they haven't yet got in uh, funding from an Eagle investor, but maybe they have a uh, little bit of backing from from family and friends and so forth. So it's quite an early stage range in this, in this case for the Founder Institute. And it, we're working to fit into the ecosystem and partner with the ecosystem. So it, it looks like I have a little bit of extra time if there are some questions. OK, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dimitris. And now, uh, yes, Kasper. Do you want to use that one? If it works, I will definitely use this one. Yeah, it's a long press. Let's see if this works. Yeah, works. Talking about the screen, no? I, I actually don't need a screen. Wow, where was the Founders Institute when we found, tried to found the uh, FSCons? Um, anyway, I'm here to tell you about, uh, I'm going to take two minutes to tell you about uh, books that changed my life. Uh, 
they're in one particular category, and they're in the category of self-help books. So if you turn off your uh, your listening mode right now, uh, you will not help yourself. Um, I've read other books that have changed my life, uh, but these are in the category of self-help. Uh, the first one that I wanted to talk to, about, to you about is The Now Habit. It's got a long title, uh, Procrastination, blah, 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 something. But it's called The Now Habit, and it's really cool because uh, it helps you uh, realize how you talk to yourself, how you've learned to talk to yourself by, you know, first listening to your parents and then listening to your teachers and then becoming your parents and your teachers in your head. Um, this at least happened to me. I think that's how we teach our kids, uh, you know, when, like the most powerful uh, device you have for controlling the world is controlling yourself. And the most powerful way to control yourself is by speaking to yourself. And uh, the Now Habit uh, talks about that, specifically it talks about how to talk better with yourself. I recommend you guys read it. Uh, I have the cover, but it doesn't matter. You can find it. Uh, there's also uh, a second uh, book uh, that I would like to uh, recommend. I have three books to recommend here. Uh, the second book is called Getting Past No. And it's really just a book on talking to people about things. It's, it's really like a strategy for better communicating with uh, people who are important in your life. Uh, getting, uh, getting to an agreement or at least not to an argument with you know, your significant other, your, your child, your boss, your co living, co-working person, your parent. And uh, the, there's a, like a corollary to that and it's called getting, getting to yes. Uh, so once you've read or listened to the book, getting past no, you want to get to yes. Uh, basically to agree on something together with another person or a group. Um, and then there's this um, third book uh, that I wanted to, to share with you that has really helped me. Um, and it's in the same vein. It's called uh, Crucial Conversations. Uh, and it's really uh, this uh, group of uh, people in the Harvard negotiation classes uh, that worked really hard on, uh, on figuring out how people who uh, are more effective at coming to solutions with other people, how they do that. And so they sat down and over a decade almost, they studied how people uh, work out problems and, and who everybody else in their admirement points to as the person that they need in the room for the group to uh, work out problems, to get somewhere. And then they've distilled that and put it together in sort of a strategy. And it's not like a strategy of how to manipulate people. It's a strategy of how to um, listen better and through listening get better at talking with people. Thank you, that's it. Okay, so uh, Reza, the floor is yours to talk about to enable freedom. Um, my name is Reza, I'm coming from Gothenburg. One of my <coughs> favorite topics always been freedom and I always had a lot of talk with friends about what's freedom, how we can have it, how we can enable it, how we can extend it and we, in which way, to whom it applies and to whom it applies um, is a very interesting part. Uh, individuals, organizations, other entities that we made up during centuries or 
the nature, the other entities that we haven't involved with uh, during centuries. But specifically, now I like to share with you my thoughts about how we can enable freedom for individuals. In layman terms, if we want to define freedom is uh, freedom of choice, freedom of will, I do whatever I want, but there are two sides um, to have freedom. One is from environment, one is from the individual to have freedom. Uh, from the environment is availability, from the individual is capability. If there is no available thing to choose from, there cannot be a freedom here. I'm free to listen to any song I want, but there should be available songs to choose from. If I want to listen to a song, if they're available, then I need to be capable of playing them, hearing them, and listening to them. So how we can enable freedom or extend freedom is, first is to, have, uh, to make it available in any field it is, if it is music, if it is coded, if it is um, social choice, if it is marriage or anything, any area that you think of. We need to make it available. The other part, capability, to make people capable of choosing something or doing something is to teach them. If I want to express my feeling, I'm free to express my feeling. There is a podium for me to express my feeling, but I cannot find right words to express, ex uh, express exactly what I mean. So I need to learn that, to teach people, to make it possible for them to learn I need to be able to learn to talk, to think about economics, to think about how to write code and everything like that, to be able to uh, um, practice my freedom. Yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Any question or thought or suggestion? <laughs> Thank you. Anyone? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, it's Herbert. Okay, uh, I'm Herbert, Herb, uh, and I'm here to talk about my favorite topic, that's old computers. Um, and uh, I want to talk a bit about why it is interesting, why we should care at all, and give a nice example of interesting things I discovered not too long ago. And first, why should we care? Uh, firstly, the history of computing is a very important part, I think, of our uh, uh, society, uh, the history of our society. Um, also, it teaches us, or can teach us, how technology works. Um, sometimes technology also got forgotten, and it's interesting to rediscover it. And in my case, it was also to fulfill dreams. Like when I was still in high school, I saw the ads of. Some microsystems workstations, which cost something like costed at that point still something like thirty thousand to sixty thousand dollars, and uh, now I get it for free basically, and that led me to my first con collection of computers, mostly old workstations. 
sometimes from eBay, sometimes uh, for free from, fr from other friends. Um, but yeah, that was how everything started. But what I want to talk about at the moment uh, is uh, about two years ago I moved to Sweden and I had no idea about what is going on with computers in Sweden. Um, and then at some point I discovered at a shop such a machine. And I had no idea what it is. And, but I bought it, it was uh, reasonably cheap. And it turned out it looks a bit like a pocket calculator, but it uh, weighs about uh, 20 kilograms. And <laughs> um, when you open it, actually it looks like that inside. So no fancy electronics, but lots of mechanical gears. And that was somehow interesting. Um, unfortunately, um, pretty soon after I tried to get it running, uh, the power supply, so this one is actually electromechanical. So the power supply blew, the magic smoke uh, went out, and the machine stopped working. And I didn't have time to fix that yet. But then I discovered this beauty. Does more or less the same, looks quite different, and it is hand-driven. No power supply, no magic smoke involved. Um, and then I learned a bit how to use it, and it's quite fun. I have it in my office. Uh, from time to time, people see it, and are very happy if I explain to them how to use it. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty high tech. So <laughs> uh, recently I got one of these. And it's also really nice. I guess most people know what a, an abacus is. Um, and this one is actually kind of high tech because it helps you by different colors to count fives. And you might notice that there's one row with only four beats that was uh, at that point, for example, to count with quarters, um, which is quite common if you have prices, five euro 50 or something like that. But actually, that's pretty tedious. It's nice for adding and subtracting, but as soon as you want to multiply, it's really tedious. And that works really nice with that. But here you always have to think yourself, when do I have an overflow when adding and stuff like that, and that's really tedious. And that, then I got this. It's also really low tech. It's not much more than an abacus, but this machine does magic about overflow. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but uh, you, it's basically a tablet. You use a stylus to to uh, use it, so you put the stylus in one of these holes where the number is, and then you draw either to the top or to the bottom, and by adding, you, ha you draw it, if you can draw it completely to the top, you can go around and do the overflow to the next digit, which is really nice, really surprising if you think how simple the technology behind it is. Um, so that's my most recent thing, um, but there's always a holy grail. So I have to admit, I'm a collector. I like collect stuff, uh, feel much too much stuff, um, especially given how much space I have in my apartment. But the holy grail would be this, <laughs> the Kota. It's basically like the other larger mechanical uh, calculator, but it actually fits into a hand. It's basically the pocket calculator of mechanical calculation machines. But I saw it on Tradera recently, one for 8,000 and the other for 5,600 crowns. So that's my holy grail so far. Thank you. And uh, the, slates are, the slides are online. Um, I hope I can soon also put my own pictures up there. So it's on, yeah. And make sure you have it close enough to the mouth. And you want to talk about alternatives to GNU? Yeah. Yes. So, um, so 
so my, sl my slides aren't working, so I'll just do it by hand or by voice. Um, I want to talk about al alternatives to using GNU tools in Linux distributions. Uh, you don't see it a lot. You almost always have uh, core utils, bin utils, uh, GCC, and other things. Uh, but recently I have been doing some work on Alpine Linux, which is a small, secure, super user Linux. How many of you have used Docker? Yeah, a lot of you. Uh, some of you probably know of Alpine because it's, it's very popular due to its, its small, uh, small base image, under five megabytes, the, the root file system. Um, in terms of security, we ship uh, Linux hardened by default, the kernel which is an unofficial port of PAX and GRSEC. Um, we also compile everything as position-independent executables and with stack smashing protection, which is nice for uh, avoiding buffer overflows and the usual crap every, every security tester knows of. Um, most of the Alpine tools are MIT licensed and it's all open source. We use uh, CJIT plus Patchwork and GitHub for the development. And uh, well, it's a small distro, so we'd love some help. I want to port Alpine to, to MIPS and have it compete with, for example, OpenWRT and, and projects like that. Uh, to create packages, we have something similar to the Arch Linux package builds. We call them AP, AP, uh, APK builds. Alpine has its own package manager called APK. It's lightning fast and used to be uh, a series of shell scripts, but we rewrote them because obvious reasons. <laughs> um, so if anyone wants to participate, it's open, uh, alpinelinux.org and alpinelinux on GitHub. Any questions? Yeah? Yeah, uh, basically GR security is a set of patches for the Linux kernel, uh, something like Suhosin for PHP. But GR security changed their model and licensing, so you have to subscribe to this uh, proprietary kind of thing to get the patches. But we ship Linux hardened, which is uh, it's a port, like a, a fork, an alternate fork of it. So we still still ship it by default. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Daniel, and uh, it's next is Jeffrey. Okay, so I will just talk about a small thing I started to do recently. Uh, the title is how to nest type people into contributing to your projects. So I contribute and manage a few open source projects. And uh, at some point, uh, I reduce to a set of projects that I think are really cool, interesting, technically challenging. I do cool stuff and like that. But I realized that I cannot clone myself. There's really too much work, and I have to find contributors. So, as you might know, lots of open, so open source projects have only like one, two real maintainers, so getting uh, frequent contributors is a challenge. So I started like a lot of people did, like, okay, I mark some issues as easy, like do some documentation, do some tests and whatever, and it's easy to contribute and do so, some small patches, and it does not work. Like, if you have a large project with a good reputation, people will want to contribute and they will do that. But for whatever project that they just heard about, they don't care. This is the boring work you don't want to do and you 
tell to people, okay, if you want to go and be a contributor, do the, the shit I don't want to do. <laughs> so that does not work. And there's still all of this cool stuff I have in mind, and I cannot do it because I don't have the time. And so at some point I decided, okay, what if I found people that want to do the cool stuff? Like, it's much more appealing uh, to go and say, okay, there's this thing, I don't have the time to do it, and it touches all over the, co the source code, and it, wa it will be amazing if someone does that. Wha what's the effect of that? You go into a room of smart people, and you try to, to say, okay, I do cool stuff, and you brag and whatever, but it does not achieve anything if when you say, okay, uh, and uh, patch is welcome and whatever. But if you go into a room of smart people and say, okay, so this is the thing that's hard for me, I don't know how to do it, there will always be someone in the room who say, oh, I know better than him how to do that. <laughs> and it worked so well. <laughs> like, I do this parser library in Rust called NUM. Most of the big changes in the code came from people that just randomly appeared on IRC and say, hey, there's this thing you cannot do, you should do, do it that way. And then, hop, they go. And then I keep the boring work for myself because I still care about the project, so writing the test and documentation and whatever, I will do that anyway. But now I have people that will take the time to invest inside the project because when you do small issues and things like that, they just learn a very small part of the code, they don't learn much, and there's still a gap between that and being a real contributor. But if you give, okay, there's this huge task, and it touches everything, they will learn your project, and then they will contribute. So, like I have a colleague that just did front-end work, he's a, an amazing J JavaScript developer, right now he's working, he's do, doing big patches into the, the, the HTTP proxy we are building in Rust, and like it took him like two weeks to get through the code, and to, he asked for help and whatever, so it's contributing, they, they have to talk to you to understand the code. They, get, they, they become part of the team. Now you have a team. So this is not just a small trick that I try to, to get people to do now. Do not give the, the shitty work to people and say, okay, you have to contribute that way. Give them the cool stuff. Thank you. And, and j just the last thing, uh, tomorrow I have a talk at 11 and I will talk about the actual boring work we have to do. Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, before we do the social announcement, uh, which is the last one, I would like to thank every one of the speakers for following the time uh, constraints. So we are actually in time, as you can see. Uh, and uh, there were a few that we had to postpone for tomorrow. Uh, so uh, there are still plenty of opportunity to think about things to have a lightning talk about tomorrow. So it's 17, it starts tomorrow. So uh, I hope a few of you have already, well, I need to talk about this just because you were here now. So uh, uh, let's hope so and uh, sign up uh, tomorrow and just do the same procedure with the sticky notes on, on, on the board and then I will try to arrange uh, the order and uh, thank you all for participating and uh, uh, Kasper, uh, please uh, do some social announcements. Thank you. Yes, and uh, for tomorrow, uh, so instead of me repeating it uh, over and over, uh, you need to have the microphone uh, in a good position and it should look something uh, like this. So uh, either you, you don't have it down here. No, you should have it either 45 degrees angle uh, or uh, very uh, close to 90 degrees, but then close to the mouth, okay? so. Um, that's how we hope it will sound very good, uh, both for the recording and uh, just to not uh, uh, miss it, 
it's not only for the recording, it's also for being uh, accessi accessible so that even if you're not recording, everyone will be able to hear. So use the microphone, not, not like this, but more like this or like this. Thanks, uh, Le Pioran. Uh, give it up to our uh, smashing host. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to give a very short announcement before we uh, do the last round of talks uh, today. Uh, and then uh, the reason is that uh, a, at 8 o'clock, the door is open at uh, Oslo Hackerspace, Hackeria. Uh, for a FSCon's exclusive party uh, that uh, I mentioned earlier today, but uh, it, it warrants saying again, you need to bring your badge, uh, you need to be signed up, but uh, if you signed up through uh, Eventbrite for FSCon's, or if you're a speaker or a volunteer that said yes to the party, you're already signed up, yeah? But uh, if you're not in any of these three categories, you need to sign up. Right, and bring your badge, because then you can party, and uh, the speakers will join us after the dinner. Right, so uh, enjoy the last uh, round of spe uh, speakers, and uh, see you there. Where do you sign up? If you go at the FSCon's list, uh, sorry, m website, there is uh, on the right side. There's news items. That one of them is the party. Ooh. Interesting. I like that. Uh, <laughs> sexy lighting. Um, yeah, so and if you go into that news item, there's a link. So, But only you only need to do that if you're not in one of those three categories that I just mentioned. But bring your badge, and I see you there. All right, cheers. <laughs>